Here's another thing I was thinking before I go. Well, this is just going to all be about doing the Fenway gig. I was thinking about all the gigs that I did <clears throat> that led up there. I remember when I was living in New York, you know, after I did stand up for three and a half years and moved down to New York, and then I came back and I headlined Spaghetti Freddy's. <laughs> Which to me is one of the worst names ever for a fucking restaurant. There's just something about it rhyming. It's just silly. It just doesn't make me feel like you're going to take anything seriously. Uh, Spaghetti Freddy. Like they're just going to fucking, you know, reach into the pot with a big spoon, swirl it around, and then pull out a bunch of spaghetti and then just fucking throw, you throw it, like hang onto the spoon and just zing it across the room. Did you have fucking spaghetti? So I played the basement of Spaghetti Freddy's on Rue 1 in Norwood, right next to that golfing driving range. And there was a Howard Johnson's across the parking lot. And I did fucking stand up there, too, over the years. I think if you go up Route 1, at some point, every restaurant had an open mic or something like that. Or Nick's Comedy Stop. Like Nick's Comedy Stop, I remember, had... Um, Oh, fuck, sorry. Tired here. Nick's Comedy Stop had, um, like, these satellite rooms. They had their downtown main room, and then they, they would have them, like, in Chinese restaurants. Or they, there was, like, this fucking, like, nightclub ballroom-looking place out on Framingham on Route 9. There was one in Randolph's at, like, the Holiday Inn. There was the Maui in... Uh, Brockton, Mass, with the highest fucking stage ever. It was like he was standing on top of a refrigerator box, except it was solid. I remember that you were way up in the air on this little fucking postage stamp of a stage. For some fucking reason, like, like your feet were like five feet above the heads of the people sitting down in the front row. I don't know why. And the room wasn't even that big. You just They just had you up there. Um... I don't know what. I felt like like uh, like you were in Superman talking to uh, Lauren Green or some shit. Um, anyway, the uh, and then they had the the Kowloon in Saugus, another Chinese restaurant. Just all of those gigs came back. But I remember when I did Spaghetti Freddy's, uh, they had a function room down in the basement. Sorry, you on in here? I fucking went. Oh, I, when I tell you, dude, like, there was like eight people in the crowd. There was like, and I knew like six of them. It was like, you know, my family members came out and a couple of their friends. And then there was like a two top of strangers. And I'm trying to play this fucking gig by just looking over everybody's head because I actually am related to 80% of the crowd. And I still somehow had like a decent set, but I just remember, um, I just remember being really embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't wait. I don't even think it was embarrassing at that point in my career because I wasn't selling any tickets. I think that the victory was as shitty as this gig is. I am headlining it. I've worked my way up to headlining the basement of a Spaghetti Freddy's in Norwood, Massachusetts. So I think I, on some level, I felt like my career was still moving forward. While at the same time, I was also thinking like, are you really headlining on a gig like this? Or are you more just sort of going on last? And um, I still think I had an okay set. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, there was just a lot of those moments that I guess should have been like humiliating enough to make you want to think about doing another job. But like, if you love doing stand up, that never enters your head. You just sort of look at them. It's just funny stories to tell your friends. Yeah, I played a place called Spaghetti Freddy's basically in front of my family members and a couple people I went to high school with and this random couple. <laughs> <laughs> oh.
Oh, my God. I just remember, too, like the fucking... I remember when across the parking lot, between the driving range, between the two places was a driving range. And that other place was a Howard Johnson's. And I remember playing the lounge area. And it actually ended up being... A, I actually killed... It was a crowded bar and no one was fucking really listening. And I went up there and I, I improv something that got people to pay attention. And I was actually able to get on a little bit of a roll and did like five minutes. And I got off stage and there was this comedian, Greg Carey, who I had not seen in like 20 years, who showed up to my gig in Queens, New York with Tommy Amato. And uh, it was so great to see him. Another guy who was always nice to me, just like Tony V and would help you out and everything um, was not, you know, I'm not, you know, some of the, just, it was just when I started in stand up, stand up was in a nosedive. It was like in a free fall coming out of the eighties where all of a sudden people just didn't want to go out to comedy clubs anymore. And it was, it was like a housing bubble except with stand up and all of these rooms were collapsing and the work was, not really drying up as much as it was coming back down to um, like the level that it should have been at. And a lot of people were getting squeezed out. So there was a lot of bitter headliners. And uh, Greg Carey and Tony V were never like that because they were both funny guys. So they weren't like nervous. They they knew that they were going to be fine, I guess. I don't know. Are they just good people? I have no idea. So anyway... Um, yeah, I remember fucking bombing there. I'm just going to be telling stories the whole fucking time. All, all of my early day gigs. Like Route 1 to me is an amazing like highway because when I'm on the North Shore, that's all like my childhood when I was really, really young. And some of the places that I played, not just the Kowloon or Giggles, if you kept going up north... I remember, um, <clears throat> I remember Alan the Monkeys, which was, uh, had Dane Cook. It was a sketch group. Dane, they'd all do stand up and then they'd do sketch in the end. It was Dane Cook, Bobby Kelly, Al Del Benny, and, um, oh my God, I'm old. What was the last kid's name? It'll come to me. Um, and I opened for them. They booked themselves in like this fucking Elks Club or some shit like that because they had won the BCN Comedy Riot at Stitches and they were trying to ha headline their own show or whatever. And like we were all young and we didn't know how to promote shit. And there was like fucking like five people there. And. I remember all of us, we were just like, they were like embarrassed, but they were also like laughing and I was laughing. And it was kind of this fun moment because we were all so young and it felt cool to me to be doing their gig because everybody else's gig that I was doing had been doing it like 20 years and they were like legends of Boston comedy and we were just a bunch of young punks. And as much as nobody showed up, it was still, I was working you know, a show from these people that were part of my graduating class. And uh, long story short, whatever, it was just, it was comedy death, but like we all supported each other and laughed at each other's jokes. Um, yeah, all the way up there. Rob Steen used to have gigs up there. All of these guys, I just remember all of these fucking gigs. All the way up to like, I remember working bars in like Revere. Um, remember Dick Doherty's it had like rooms all over the place, like fucking Drake it and Danvers and all of these fucking places over the years. And I think, uh, I don't know, just driving around waiting for this fucking giant gig. I just, all of those memories came back. It was just a really, really cool time. So I apologize that I'm being old Billy Reminis here. Um, I don't feel like I've been even remotely funny on this one.